Hello, this is Nick Coons with Red7 and the Gutsy Geeks, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, comparison and analogies that we use to describe Windows versus Linux. Now, one of the things that Michael and I do on a pretty regular basis is that we go out to computer clubs around the state of Arizona and we promote Linux and open source software. And one of the questions that comes up invariably is, why don't you need antivirus software for Linux? Why are there no viruses for Linux? Uh, why is Linux so much more stable? And, uh, you know, why don't you need antivirus software, essentially? Because one of the things we mentioned is you don't need antivirus software. People want to know why. Uh, so the analogy that we tend to use, or the, <laughs> the short version is, like, that, that we use just to kind of, you know, make it simple for people is, well, you don't need antivirus software because let's, let's just think of it this way. The, the antivirus protection is built in. And I guess technically that's kind of true, not in the sense that you're protecting from viruses by going out looking for viruses in the traditional antivirus software sense, but it is true in the sense that the software just isn't really vulnerable to viruses and malicious software that's out there. But I wanted to come up with a different way of explaining it. And so I came up with an analogy, because I like analogies, those are fun. I came up with an analogy that I think would do a good job at that. And it essentially works this way. Let's say you're designing a house or a building of some sort and uh, you want to make sure you want to protect it from fire let's say there's been a lot of arson in the area recently and so you're really concerned about uh, fires and those sorts of things and you want to make sure that your building is not going to be burned down by someone coming along and throwing a match at it or something like that and of course you know I guess buildings and houses are vulnerable to that vulnerable to that sort of thing they can catch on fire they can you know that that, that happens that's why we have fire departments right um, so what you can do is, uh, you know, you're putting up your, your 2x4s or 2x6s, whatever you build it out of, and maybe you, you use some kind of, you know, you're being over paranoid about the fire protection here. So maybe you put some kind of fire tar retardant on, on, the, um, on the wood. So you spray that all on there uh, before the, uh, the, extra, the, the, uh, the outside covering of the walls go up. You put insulation in there that's been treated to not be flammable. You install uh, uh, maybe a, 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 some kind of drywall that's been treated in such a way that it can't catch on fire. Maybe you install a sprinkler system so that if there is a fire, it gets caught right away and, and is extinguished. And you have smoke alarms and, and you have everything you can possibly think of in order to protect yourself against a fire. You, you treat it all in such a way that you just don't have to worry about a fire. You at least hope you don't have to worry about them. There's always something that you could miss, right? You know, maybe there's a, a part of the house that didn't get treated. Maybe you have an overhang that, that was added on later, and now you've got to worry about, oh, well, that part wasn't treated, or it wasn't treated the same way, or it's going to catch on fire, or, you know, wh whatever it could be. Um, there's other things that can happen to it. Well, th let's say that that house represents Windows, and all this fire treatment that you're doing represents your antivirus software. So... You have your, uh, you know, your Norton or your McAfee or your Malwarebytes or your Adaware, your Spybot, Search and Destroy, all your different programs that you have out there uh, in order to protect your computer, your Windows computer, from infections. Uh, this is the, these represent all the various treatments that you apply to the computer or to, to the <laughs> to the building. You know, the fire retardants and the you know chemical treatments to make sure that they can't catch on fire or hope they can't catch on fire, but you know, these things evaporate and they wear off and you've got to have it done every year, you know. So that, that's a really good uh, analogy. I think it works out really well. So why is Linux invulnerable to these sorts of things? Well, if we're going to continue the analogy, Linux is a house made out of stone. <laughs> um, so you really don't have to worry about these sorts of things. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, putting fire retardant on it because, well, stone isn't flammable. <laughs> um, you know, you could say that the, the whole house is built out of a solid piece of stone carved to perfection. You know, however you want to uh, describe it, you can, you can do that. So, you, uh, you know, you really don't have to worry about antivirus software. That, I think, is a, is a more long-winded way uh, of explaining it. <laughs> it. It's, you know, certainly it's easier to say, okay, well, the protection's built in. And, and essentially it is. I mean, the real reasons, uh, the technical reasons why you don't have issues with viruses are because of the way the system's built. Uh, a Microsoft Windows system is essentially built by one company with one with one common code base and it's completely locked down. So you've got the system uh, that, that if one piece of it is, uh, is attacked, then it all kind of uh, comes crumbling down because it's basically a house of cards. 
you don't have the separation that you do in the Linux world. In the Linux and open source world, there are many programs to run your system that all that all accomplish everything, and these programs are all separate, and they communicate with each other using specific protocols, where one program only has access to another program using a, a set, um, you know, using a, a predetermined language. So, if one program gets infected with something, well, then that one program is infected, and that's it. That's one major reason. The other major reason is that because Microsoft is more concerned with the usability of the software than they are with uh, than they are with protecting and the security of the software. And the, an example of this might be if you're using Internet Explorer and a particular plugin like Flash is needed, that might be downloaded and installed pretty automatically. Now I know they made some changes with newer versions of Internet Explorer that you have to allow all this stuff, but essentially that philosophy is there in their software that they want to make it more user friendly more so than secure because if you're on a secure system then you have to be more concerned with what's installed in your system which means the user has to do more so if you want to play flash on Linux you have to actually go out and you have to get that plugin you have to do it somewhat manually you can do it through the package manager but it doesn't just happen on its own like it would on maybe a Windows system with the normal version of Internet Explorer so the philosophy is totally different um, and the last thing is that up until recently Windows has always been run as an administrator, and actually in many cases that's still true. When you create an account on a basic Windows system, you have a choice of are they an administrator or are they a limited user. And if they're uh, an administrator, then they have full access to the system. Well, that means any software that that user runs, including any programs that they've downloaded or anything that's been downloaded possibly without their knowledge, is also running as an administrator. Now. The downside, of course, is that the administrator has full access to everything. That's generally why people run their computers as administrator. They have full access to everything. They don't have to continuously log out and log back in or run as another user in order to get something done, something basic like installing software. So running as a limited user is much safer, but it's much more inconvenient. If you want to run as a limited user on Linux, which is the default, I mean, you really have to go out of your way to run the system as an administrator, as the root user then you can run it as a limited user, and as long as you are a member of a particular security group, then you can do things to the system, but you're going to be prompted for your password. This way, if you have software installed that is trying to do something to the system, then you don't really have to worry about it, because if it's trying to do something, you're going to get a password dialog box prompting you for your password, and realize that that doesn't correlate to anything you're trying to do. So if you're just sitting there browsing the web and all of a sudden a box pops up that says enter your password uh, that's pr provided to you by your operating system, then you're like, okay, well, this uh, I'm going to cancel out of this because it doesn't, it's not related to what I'm doing. Uh, well, on the Linux, on the Windows side, uh, they, do, they did improve that a little bit by having the user access controls where anything that needs more system, uh, system access has the, uh, uh, it pops up and asks you if you want to continue with what you're doing. The problem is, is that it asks you way too many times uh, for that, even when you're not doing system stuff, to the point where people become desensitized to it, and they just hit continue out of habit, they bypass it, or they just turn it off completely. So there's a little bit of social engineering involved in there, uh, and there's a little bit of technical involved. But overall, this uh, is, is kind of the analogy and technical explanation as to why you do not need uh, antivirus software on a Linux computer, and why probably for a long time, if not ongoing forever, you will not need antivirus software on a Linux computer. So I would recommend uh, subscribing to the Guts and Geeks podcast. You can receive these regular updates as well as the Red 7 YouTube Linux channel, uh, Red 7, uh, youtube.com slash Red 7 Linux or gutsygeeks.com. And of course, we've got fan pages for both Red 7 and the Gutsy Geeks. I would recommend subscribing to both of those as well so you can stay up on top of information that's out there. We put out tips uh, for computer usage as well as deals at Red 7. Uh, just all sorts of good information that we think is, is uh, useful to regular computer users, which is the vast majority of people out there. So thank you so much for tuning in.